Now, after the past couple of episodes in this podcast series about Pastor Keon's former spouse, wife number two, first first lady of Lighthouse Church, i.e. Lady Felicia, well, it got me to thinking, why, pray tell, would Lady Shawnee not find herself in the same position as Pastor Keon's first two wives, i.e., in receipt of one of his masterpiece divorce petitions. And the answer to this question is directly connected to the stunning events that happened after this. You served a pastor as an adjutant, and at 12 years old, you found out that your pastor was your father. Yes, sir. How did you find out? In addition to showing you why I think the events that took place after this moment And Pastor Keon's life will dictate whether his relationship with Lady Shawnee will be able to overcome those obstacles. I also want to analyze the question of whether Pastor Keon will ever be satisfied with any woman. Hi there, I'm Professor Blackmore and welcome back to my channel and to my podcast series entitled Shawnee Girl, I hope you have a prenup. And before I go any further, I want to say right here and now, before all of these people from Lighthouse Church start chirping in my comments, I am not judging anything about these events, but I'm going to tell the truth about them. But there is no real difference in the way that Pastor Keon was brought up and how I was brought up. I am not judging him or his mother because she could have been my mother. The only difference is my father ain't nowhere near being a pastor of nobody's church. But I understand the idea of fatherlessness. So let me just say all of that from the very beginning. And as always, everything I'm sharing, as always, is alleged. And it's my own opinion. So if you don't like it, please remember, that I'm not making you watch or listen to this episode. And so, with all of that being said, let the story time begin. So, so you were seeking options, trying, trying to fill a gap because, because you were exposed to church early. Yeah. Okay. And served in the church mm-hmm. and served your pastor. Yes, sir. You were his adjutant. Yes, sir. Uh, how long was it in your life that you served as a just purely as an adjutant without any understanding that you were related to him? Oh my goodness! Well, that that's <laughs> it's it's a loaded answer because I served him all the way until I got my first as my first assignment. So I found out he was my father at twelve. Okay, so um, I wasn't Let's really. Let's stop certain. right there because a lot of people uh, just gasp. <laughs> Okay. You served a pastor as an adjutant, and at 12 years old, you found out that your pastor was your father. Yes, sir. How did you find out? Now, even I knew who my father was from the moment I was born. So this is one of the things that is so gut-wrenching about this story. Can you imagine going around seeing that people have fathers? and you're almost a teenager, and you have no idea who your father is? Well, um, there was an event at school, um, and it was a father-son event called Dads and Donuts. And um, went to the event and saw all of the dads there. Mm -hmm. And just decided to go home and ask my mother one day, who is my father? And I went home and I asked her, and she looked at me and she paused. And I know her. I know my mama. Mm-hmm. I know her. I know her. I can see her sitting here and she's a hundred miles away, but I know her. And I knew something was wrong. Mm-hmm. And after what seemed to be an hour, which was probably 10 seconds, mm-hmm. she says, Dr. Brooks is your father. All of my siblings are in the room at the time. They say nothing. I ran out of the room screaming because for every year that I could remember, I used to pray and wish he was my father. 
because he was this quintessential example of what a father should be. I saw him taking care of his other children. I saw him building a ministry. I saw him amassing wealth. I saw him building apartments for the less fortunate community development corporations. He was a multi-site church in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so wow. I saw this growing up and the moment I found out, honor became hatred. Um, Why? Because I couldn't figure out how he could tell everybody every Sunday what they needed to do with their families. And I witnessed him not do any of that for me. And I got angry. And so I asked her, could I confront him? And she said, yes. Now, there are so many things about this that are just so earth shattering. But I think for me, the thing about this that is just so earth shattering is knowing that he is supposed to have a father and knowing what that means in general terms. But showing up to that event at school and seeing all of the fathers and your father is nowhere to be found. In addition, the idea that it was not until this moment that he just did not seem to have the guts to ask his mother who his father was before this point in time. And if you think this story could not be any more gut-wrenching, then you better think again because things do not get any better after the confrontation. I went to church. Um, he um, used to shake hands down at the bottom of the pulpit, the old Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And I went down there and got in line and waited on my turn to shake the pastor's hand and I asked him, I said, can I ask you a question? When nobody's around, he said, sure. As I was his little guy, I mean, he, I could see now that he had preferential treatment for me, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what all of that was. Mm -hmm. And so we went out into the fellowship hall and I looked him in his eyes like I'm looking at you and I said, are you my father? He said, yes. I said, when were you gonna tell me? He said, eventually. I didn't know what eventually meant. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant. And so I said, do you mind if we set up an opportunity to speak? He said, yes, that was on a Sunday. He decided Wednesday would be good. He had a Jeep Cherokee, I never will forget. Um, he picked me up from my house, 204 West 15th Avenue, picked me up from my mother's apartment, put me in the car. We started driving down the street and I had a list of 12 questions. And I asked him the first question um, the first question was... Before you tell me what yes. the first question was, how does it feel riding in the car, anticipating a conversation that is so important to you and totally uncertain of what the answer might be? What, what, what were you feeling? I was nervous, um, very tactful to ensure that I would present myself as a son that you could be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that I made no mistakes so that way when this conversation is over, you will grab me and you will take me back to that church and that you will tell everybody, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah. I anticipated. You had a vision I of how it was gonna go. I did. Now, the ultimate conclusion of the analysis of this episode is wrapped up in the happening of one event. I mean, the ultimate reason why this man will never be content with any woman Shani, is all wrapped up in the eventuality, if ever, of the happening of this one event. In other words, if it never happens, he will never be content, in my opinion, with Lady Shani. And so, ladies and gentlemen of this church house jury, I want you to put a bookmark right here because this is the thesis of this entire T.D. Jakes interview. And I have to say that Bishop missed his calling because he did a masterful job in this interview. But the thesis of this interview is whether Pastor Keon ever got a chance to realize the moment that he desires more than anything, even more than any relationship he can ever have with any woman. Will his father, Dr. Cato Brooks Jr., ever go out in public in the presence of any group of non-family members and declare and decree that Pastor Keon is his biological son. Everything about Pastor Keon then and even now rests on this one question. If this event never happens, 
It is my opinion that Pastor Keon will never be content in any relationship with any woman other than his mother. Can you tell me what the first question was? Um, am I as good as your other sons? Wow. So you felt like his denial at that point was your fault, like maybe you, maybe he was ashamed of you. Yeah, because he was married when I was born. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a member of the church. Mm -hmm. And my mother was the only child at that time who had had children out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. So she was a black sheep. She was the only woman who had had it. Only, yeah, only woman in the family. And everybody else was married and everybody else was upward mobile and doing all of this stuff. And here my mother is, no education, two children by the pastor of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a hard thing. How did that translate into am I as good? I, I'm just awed by the first question. We've never talked about that. No, um, it, it sounds like to me you question your value or his value of you. Yeah. Uh, how did he respond? He, he responded by making a U-turn and dropping me back, back off at the house and telling me that I was going to upset him before he had to teach Bible study. He never answered the question. I got out of the car and went back in the house. Now, as devastating as it is to not get an answer to this question, it is still secondary to the answer of the question, does the man ever publicly acknowledge Pastor Keon as his son? You go back in the house. And how did that make you feel about yourself? What I initially felt uh, was a responsibility for my mother because she warned me. Mm -hmm. So I spent all of this time pursuing somebody who was absent, overlooking the woman who was present. Now, I want to restate that again. He said, quote, I spent all of this time pursuing somebody who was absent, overlooking the woman who was present, end quote. Now, I'm sure Lady Felicia came face to face with this reality, Lady Shawnee. And what I have observed about this man is that he will tell you right to your face what he is all about. But you'll miss it because he packages everything up in profound statements and many sermons. But pay attention, Shawnee, because if you think this man is finished pursuing his father, you are sadly mistaken. And she warned me that it would end that way. She told me, you're not going to get anything out of that. But I pursued it because I thought I would be persuasive enough present myself enough. See, I've got brothers that are athletes. One brother's an athlete, so I know my dad's, a, he played semi-pro football. You love athletes. Mm -hmm. Dad, I scored 12 points last game. So that's what the origination of the question was. Am I good enough? Because he coached my brother's football team, but he had never come to one of my games. I didn't have any feelings um, about him initially. It was about my mother. After we had our talk and everything calmed down, I went back to being mad at him. What was it like? Because you didn't leave that church. Your mother didn't leave that church. No. Um, your sister didn't leave that church. No, sir. And, and we haven't even talked about that she was also his child. Um, how could you sit there? <laughs> now, what's so interesting about this is that it seems at this point that his mother finally realized that this man, Pastor Keon's biological father, was not going to leave his wife no matter how many children she was willing to have by him. I mean, think about it. His mother has not one, but two children with the married pastor of her own church and raises those same children in that church and that was still not enough pressure on the man to make him acknowledge his son. And now, this is the apartment that Pastor Keon mentioned, where they live just down the street from this church, Tree of Life Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana. And in addition to raising the children in the same church, she then lets her son, 
Pastor Keon, serve as the adjutant to this same pastor while she is still also a member of the same church where his wife and children are also members. And she suffers in silence and allows this man to do this and he does not even put her in a nice home. I mean, in other parts of this interview with Bishop Jakes, you will hear Pastor Keon make it seem like they were on government assistance. He talks about eating government cheats. And so his father was not even providing enough support to alleviate that. And his mother never saw fit to seek justice for any of this and the pain that she must have felt. Well, we'll pick up here in part B of this podcast episode so that we can learn how and why Pastor Keon, his sister, and his mother stuck around for all of this. But in the meantime, please let me know what you think about all of this by leaving your comments in the comments section below. And I hope you'll also give me a big thumbs up and I hope you'll also consider donating to this video and my entire channel ministry by donating to the Professor Blackmore Cash App. And I hope you'll also subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll be notified whenever I come back with part B of this podcast episode series. And please also follow me on TikTok and Instagram.